the simplicity of the gospel. Welcome to church. I'm glad that you're here. I'm always glad to see you in the house of God. We also want to welcome those of you who are now at this moment watching us on Facebook. And there are those who are on Zoom. And there are others who tomorrow will be on YouTube. And we are glad that God has given us the opportunity to spread the gospel beyond the four walls, beyond this village. And uh, I wouldn't say around the world because we haven't gone around the world yet, I don't think. But we are ministering in places that we have not been ministering before. We are in Psalm 19. Our text is verse 14. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O God, my strength and my redeemer. Father, I pray that the Holy Ghost will speak. That the whole, that deep would answer to deep. That the Holy Spirit will minister to our spirit. I pray tonight that there will be illumination for the entrance of your word gives light. I pray tonight, Lord, that the word of God will be powerful. Jeremiah said, thy words were found and I did eat them. And they became the joy and rejoicing of my soul. May your word bring joy and rejoicing to our soul tonight. The entrance of your word gives light. Lord, may we be able today to find truths in your word. Some perhaps that we've never heard before. But most of all, Lord, may we not be hearers only, but may we be doers of your word. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, Amen. I've been telling you that in these strange times, we are living in a, in a world that we have never seen within the last hundred years. It is really full of sorrow. Somebody said death is all, is all around. Uh, everything seems to be negative. We've got to remember that the Lord said rejoice evermore. He did say only when things are good. So we started this last Tuesday and I sent a copy of it to you this afternoon so that you could look over it again. But I want to say to you that even before your feet hit the floor, in your bedroom on mornings you should be declaring God declaring the words of God there's some declarations that you want to make that you ought to make and because time is is going swiftly I want to give you a little idea of what we went through on Tuesday night you need to look at this verse again let the words of my mouth so sometimes you're speaking words but there are times you can't be speaking words like when you're sitting in the doctor's office or something you're at the bank, you can't be speaking words. That does not tell us we can't say something because the next part says, not only let the words of my mouth, but the meditation of my heart. Let the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. So you need to find some words that you could use every day as you meditate with the Lord. And then in the next 15 minutes, I want to show you that in not only meditating upon the word of God, not only speaking the word of God, but we're going to be talking at the end of this message about declaring the word of the Lord. This is time that people need to hear the word of God. The gospel of Jesus Christ is the power of God unto salvation. Not your testimony or somebody else's testimony as good as that may be. But the Lord said that the word of God, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. For it, the gospel of Jesus Christ, is the power of God unto salvation. We should be more than ever be willing to speak to people in our catchment area. Whether they are in our homes or on our job. Because death is knocking at the door. And who knows who is going next? Nobody knows. So it is your responsibility to have the word of God on your lips. It is your responsibility in this season to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Just one verse is good enough. One scripture is good enough. It doesn't have to be a, a, our sermon like I'm doing, but you've got to remind people. Like I went to, the, to Erica's uh, yesterday, and the man said, oh my goodness, it is so hot. Um, and I can have to work without my shirt, he said. And I was malicious enough to say to him, you think this is the hottest place that there is? He said, I think so. I think this is the hottest place. They ain't got a place that can be hotter than this. 
I said, well, there's a place called hell that is a lot hotter than this. He said, well, I ain't going there. I got a lot more wickedness to do before you get there. I got a lot more wickedness to do before I get there, no matter how hot it is. And I said, well, never mind, never mind what came out of his mouth. The Holy Ghost is able to speak to him. Sometimes we get the impression that the Holy Ghost does not speak to sinners. That's not true. The Bible said, when he, the spirit of truth has come, listen to this, he will convict, give me the next two words, he will convict. Give me the next two words. He will convict the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. So when you open your mouth and you give the scripture, the Holy Ghost will take that. Because don't forget, no man can come unto God except the Spirit draws him. So the Spirit interacts with ungodly people as well. Look at the scripture here. When he, not it, the Spirit of truth, you hear what he's called, when he has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself. There's another scripture which says, he will convict, or it might even say convince, the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. Three things, the Holy Ghost. So you've got to open your mouth. We're going to read that scripture in a minute. And you've got to give the Holy Ghost something to work with. Let, those, let, let some witness go into the ears of somebody. Um, so you need on a daily basis to be making some confessions and some declarations. This is what we went through. Uh, we're going to read it when it comes. Okay, look at this here. John 16, 8. And when he, the Holy Ghost is a he, when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin. If the Holy Ghost doesn't reprove them, who is going to reprove them? It's the Holy Ghost. He's going to reprove them of righteousness. They need to practice righteousness. They need to be righteous in the sight of God. And he's going to convict them, reprove them of judgment because there's a time of judgment coming. So sometimes we think that we are not getting through to people, but the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit is ministering to those people. The Holy Ghost says, one more time, he will reprove the world. He doesn't say the believer, but the world. So that's what God is going to do. So we get up in the mornings and before the devil causes us to fill our life with darkness, because this is a spin-off of a text in, 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 um, that we use in Romans chapter 13, where the Lord said, the night is far spent, and we live in night season. From since, since Adam fell, the Bible tells us that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The glory is supposed to be brightness. Ever since then, we've been living in the night season. But the Bible tells us in our first text that the night is far spent, the day is at hand, the day of the coming of the Lord, the day of your death is at hand. So let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. So before we go out into the world every day, we need to spend some time with God. So you get up and you say, Lord, I choose to give you the first part of my day every day. I mean, you open your mouth and you say this, the words of your mouth. Or if it's not convenient because you don't want to wake up your wife or your husband who's next to you, the meditation of your heart is, is good enough. Lord, I choose to be a peacemaker today. Lord, I choose today to let my attitude glorify you. These are things that we need to say. Lord, I choose to be in your presence today where there's a fullness of joy. For your word says in the presence of the Lord, there's a fullness of joy. Lord, I choose to dwell in your secret place today because you said I am blessed if I dwell in the secret place of the Most High. Lord, I choose to pray every day. Lord, I will put you first in my life every day and not only on Sundays. These are things that you could say. Lord, I'm desperate for your help. Lord, I need your strength in this area of my life. For I am weak in this area and I keep falling. Lord, fill my weakness with your power. Father, I am believing you for miracles today. So that when the Lord says pray without ceasing. When you pray, you're just talking to God, you know. And you see how you could pray without ceasing? In the bus, 
Your meditations could be what I'm saying here now. In the shower, on the job, this could be your meditation. The psalmist said, your, medita your, med your word has been my meditation all the day long. Today, Lord, I choose to walk in your favor. Father, show me the path to go. Let me give you some that we didn't have last week. Lord, help me to put on behavior that represents Jesus Christ. Whether it's in speech or whether it's in dress or whether it is an attitude. Help me to put on behavior that represents Jesus Christ. Lord, when people look at me today, or when they hear me speak, or when they watch my body language, may I show Jesus. May they see Jesus in me. Say, Lord, today I cannot act like everyone else. Lord, I'm a child of God. I'm a chosen generation. I'm a royal priesthood. I'm here to show forth the praises of him who has called me out of darkness into his marvelous light. So I can't spend all my day criticizing every effort that the government is making to help us. I can't spend every day doing this. Thing. Lord, I cannot act like everyone else. Lord, I will sow some seed today. I refuse, God, to live stressed out. And if I'm going through the valley, Lord, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff will comfort me. Lord, Father, you take care of the sparrows. I am more valuable than sparrows. And I know, I confess today that you are taking care of me. Lord, I put you first in my life today. Above my husband, above my wife, above my children, above my investment, above my, my job. Lord, I put you first in my life today. I put you first before the supermarket, so I'll come to church before I go to the supermarket. Lord, help me to meditate today upon your goodness. Oh, there's so much negativity around. If you listen today to the, the, the program that was held by government concerning COVID, everything was negative. We, as believers of God, we are the ones that must put some positivity in the life of those people who are depressed, those people who don't have any hope. That is why you ought to know the scriptures. That is why you ought to know Jesus. People are so down. People, do, people are hopeless. People are killing themselves. If things get worse, People have already spent the little savings they had last year stocking up this and that. What will happen this year? People are losing jobs. Businesses are closing down. Everything seems to be hopeless. But we are the ones. We are the ones. The Bible said that the God of all hope will help us to, to be able to comfort others with the comfort wherewith we are comforted of God. The same comfort that God gives to us, we ought to be able to share that. So apparently this is no time for pulling down and tearing down. This is no time for criticizing and things like that. This is a time when we all got to huddle together, brethren. We all got to come together. Not only as a church, but as a family, the house you live in. This is a time to give hope and to those children. Stop hollering at them. Stop accusing them of eating everything out of the fridge. There, there are children that will get depressed and discouraged like everybody else. They don't work anywhere. And just like if you feel like eating two biscuits, you go eat two biscuits. They feel like eating two biscuits sometimes, but they don't work. How are they going to get the biscuits? They've got to get the biscuits that you buy. So stop quarreling. Stop complaining. Let us be sensitive these days. Let us be sensitive. In these days, if you look at worldwide statistics, suicide has increased. Marriages are falling apart. Families are having severe problems. You must pull these things up on, the, on your computer and read about them. Things are not going well. But the word of God is in your mouth. And you need to share it. Lord, today I'm going to make decisions that are pleasing to you. Father, I'm so glad that you are thinking of me. I'm so thankful that the Holy Ghost is praying for me. Because Romans chapter 8 
Verse 26, I think, says that the Holy Ghost makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And the Bible also said that Jesus ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. And there at the right hand of the Father, he is making intercession for the saints. So Jesus is making a decision for me. The Holy Spirit is making a decision for me. This gives me hope. This gives me courage. This makes me want every morning to fight the good fight of faith and lay hold on eternal life. Father, I believe that you are the answer to every one of my problems. I believe that you're the answer to every one of my problems. So today, Lord, I will cast my burdens upon you. I will help others to bear their burdens. I trust that you're remembering some of what I'm saying. And that in the comfort of your hearts, this is what you'll be saying to the Lord. Because don't forget, you're not just saying them. You're speaking it to the Lord. Lord, I will bear somebody else's burden today. I will give somebody else a hand up. Lord, I'll give somebody else a few dollars to buy some food. Rather than talk about them and say that they were working for so long and they ought to have money. Lord, I'm so thankful that I have some that I can share with somebody else. Can I get an amen? Lord, thanks for your healing power that is at work in me right now. So all day long, you could talk to the Lord. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable. If it is trouble... If it's being a troublemaker, if it is criticism and deceit and slander, those words of your mouth are not acceptable and pleasing in the sight of God. But we want the word of God. Lord, I'm standing expectantly on your promise. Lord, you've promised to be with me. Lord, you said you'll never leave me nor forsake me. I'm standing on that. Lord, you said no plague would not come near my dwelling. I'm standing on that. Lord, you said that you'll preserve me from all evil. You said you'll preserve my soul. You said you'll preserve my going out and my coming in. Lord, I stand expectantly on your promises. Because you are a God that cannot lie. Well, let's start this tonight. When you're just there and you can't fall asleep. Somebody said count the stars no we're not counting any stars we're going to talk to God and brethren sometimes a one liner sometimes when we pray we think we got to pray for 15 minutes or 20 minutes but brethren sometimes a one liner is so good listen to listen listen to listen to, to Peter Lord if it be thou bids me come to thee on the water just one one just one sentence the Lord said come and look at the miracle a miracle he had never seen before. It had never happened on earth before. Peter put his feet outside that boat and began to walk on the water. As a result of one, one sentence. When fire fell from heaven and consumed the sacrifice, Elijah had only prayed a prayer of 73 words. And I can read 73 words in two minutes. And look what happened. Lord, let it be known that thou art God of Israel and that I'm doing this according to your will. And as he prayed 73 words in the King James Version, you could count it, the fire of God fell from heaven. Sometimes it is not always the length, but the intensity and the relationship that we have with God. For the Bible says that the effectual, the prayer that's going to have any effect, fervent, which means hot and boiling, the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man accomplishes much it's not always the length of time sometimes we spend hours before God Jesus said to his disciples could you not have watched with me one hour we could spend an hour before before God and sometimes we advocate that, a, that an hour in the presence of God is good time to get to know him and he'll get to know you it's not always that we have a one-line prayer, but one-line prayers sometimes are very, very good. Lord, I'm glad that you're thinking of me. The Bible says, he knows the way that I take. And when he has tried me, in the book of Job, when he has tried me, I'm going to come forth as pure gold. 
We don't like the trials. Who like trials? But when it's all finished, we're going to come forth better than the gold you see being sold downtown at the jewelry. But that only happens after we are trying. Lord, I'm glad. Jeremiah 29 and 11. Listen to what this Jeremiah 29 and 11 says. God has a word that he's given to us tonight that he cares about us. He said, Lord, I know the thoughts that I think towards you. The Lord is thinking about you. Somebody said if the Lord had a wallet, your picture would be in it. If the Lord had a wallet, your picture would be in it. Every time you open it, it sees you. The Lord is thinking about you. For I know the thoughts I think towards you. People will think evil about you. But you think God is thinking evil about you? No. He said, my thoughts are thoughts of peace. Huh? My thoughts are thoughts of peace and not evil. To give you an expected end. Another translation says, to give you a future and a hope. I don't know about you, but I'm glad that God is thinking about me. And then he said, he said, for my thoughts, the Lord is speaking, are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways. For as the heavens are higher, so, so are my thoughts towards you. God's thoughts towards us are real high. If we could have those thoughts towards each other, it would be great. But we have the tendency always to think even about each other. Although we know Philippians chapter 4 and verse 6 says this. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 6. I want to change your thoughts. Let us be a family here. Think good of other people. Be, uh, not a little further down, which says, about whatsoever, things are lovely. Ah, right here. Look what we should be thinking about. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true. The thing that you're thinking about, the brother, may not be true. No wonder the Lord said you should prove all things. Whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, another word for just is fear. Whatsoever things are pure, don't only think impure things about us. Whatsoever things are lovely, Whatsoever things are of good report. How come we always think of the things that are bad report? Whatsoever things are of good report. If there's any virtue in it. The word virtue means moral excellence. If there be any virtue in it. And if, if it is praiseworthy. If you could give praise to God about it. Think on these things. So the Lord is even telling us what we should think about. Let me talk to you a little bit. About making declarations of the word of God. Having told you that now, I want you to understand that it is God that tells us that we should declare these things. Psalm 22 and verse 22. I'm talking about declaration. You should be getting up in the midst of the congregation and declaring what the Lord has done for your soul. You should be declaring God's goodness. But let's read it. Psalm 22, 22. I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the congregation will I praise thee. No time you praise God in your bathroom, in your shower. There's nothing wrong with that. But God wants you to praise him in the midst of the congregation. If we are not doing that, we are violating scripture. Church should never be dead. Church should never be boring. I will declare thy name. When God has healed you, don't keep it to yourself Come and declare Jehovah Rapha, the Lord that heals. Talk to me, somebody. Huh? Declare the name of the Lord. The Lord, our healer. When the God has, uh, when you have fought under the banner of the Lord, declare him to be Jehovah Nissi. The word banner means flag. And when we are in God's army, God has a banner. Like the, like the defense force has a banner. It's a flag. And we are flying, we are fighting under the banner of Jehovah. And we've got to let the devil know that, that we are on the side of Jehovah Nissi. So declare the name of the Lord unto my brethren. If I come to you and ask you to give a testimony in these sermons, in these services, you need to have one ready. Declare what the Lord has done for your soul. 
Look at Psalm 66 and verse 16. Declaration. This is testimony. You're testifying of what God has done for you. When you come to church, you should always have a testimony. In Colossians chapter 5, we're going to see there, I don't know which verse, but the Lord has given us a little template for a good service. And it says when you come together, one should have a psalm. And before I mess the verse up, I'm going to wait until it comes up. So when we come to church, it's not only we do praise and worship, and then the pastor preaches, and you go home. No, he says when we come together, somebody should have a psalm. So you should have a psalm to read. It is always difficult when we ask you to read the psalm. Because sometimes they are having words that you might not know and you would get embarrassed. At one time, many years ago in this church, I asked a lady to read the psalm for us. I did not know she couldn't read and write. And she was so embarrassed. But if you came, you said, Pastor, I have a psalm this morning. Do you have a psalm already or can I read a psalm? It means that you would have gone through it during uh, your time at home. You would have gone uh, to the Bible on your computer. And you would hear how those people pronounce the words. That's what I do. How they pronounce the words. And you will be able to come and read a psalm. So you read a psalm. You give a testimony. You do something else. And the service is, it is really, really what it ought to be. Every part giving glory to God. Somebody may have a prophecy. A word of prophecy. So when you come together, somebody should have a psalm. If it's not a Colossians, it's someplace else. You should have a psalm. Somebody should have a, okay, look, it's right there. How is it then, brethren? When you come together, see those words, come together? You can't come together so much on Zoom, you know. When you come together, everyone, not only for the pastor and Pastor Chantel, not only for the praise and worship leaders, every one of you should have a psalm. So if I say to you, Sonia, Sophia, come with your psalm and read, you shouldn't be trembling. You should have left one with a psalm in your heart. I mean, in, in your Bible, that if the pastor asks me, I have a psalm. And it's not the pastor that's putting you on the spot. If there's anybody putting you on the spot, it is God. We should have a psalm. Somebody should have a doctrine. The word doctrine means teaching. So you could take five minutes and say, this morning in my devotion, this is what the Lord said to me. You know, you're not going to take over the whole service. Five minutes. You should have a teaching. Somebody should have a tongue. I hear that tongues finish with, you don't speak in tongues because it's rubbish. But the Lord said when you come together, everybody has a tongue. Listen to this. Everybody have a revelation. Oh, the Lord revealed the scripture to me. I've read this for so many years. But all of a sudden I read it this morning and this is what the Lord revealed to me. You see how service it should be? You think that we want to be here myself and Pastor Charles doing everything ourselves? You think that, no, 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 that's not what it ought to be. You might think so, but no, no, no. We will be violating what God said. This is what God said you should do. Everybody should have an interpretation. Not necessarily an interpretation of tongues, but an interpretation of the scripture that you have. Like just now I told you, when he, the spirit of truth has come. And somebody might want to say, well, I didn't realize that the Holy Ghost interacted with the world like that. The scripture said he will convince the world. We thought it was only the church. We thought it was only the believer. So you understand what, what an interpretation is. And he said, let all things be done, not because you want to show off, but let all things be done for the building up of the church. Can I get an amen to that, somebody? So you, you, you declare that when you come to the house of God, don't be prepared to sit down there all the time. You wave your hand at me and say, Pastor, I have a testimony. Don't take 10 minutes. Take three minutes or four minutes. Remember that you're not the only person in church. Okay. Remember that you do things decently and in order. But you should not just come and sit on a bench. There must be something. So let's go back to verse 25 one more time and read this. What is it then? How is it done then? How is it done then, brethren? When you come together, every one of you should have a psalm, uh, a doctrine, a tongue. Every one of you, could, every one of you there could be misinterpreted. Because you could think that every one of you must have a psalm. And everyone must have a tongue. No, each one will have something else. Every one of you would have something else. Somebody will have a tongue. Somebody might have a doctrine. Somebody will have an interpretation. But that is how it ought to be. So Psalm 66 and verse 16 says, Come and hear all ye that fear the Lord. And I will declare to you what the Lord has done for my soul. 
in the 50s and in the 60s. But let me ask a question before I go on. When last have you heard anybody in church stand to their feet and say, I am saved. I know I am saved. I am on my way to heaven. I am born again. Have you heard that in church in the last 10 years? Not the 50s and the 60s when I went to church. Almost every time. We might criticize the old people for saying the same thing. But they said, thank God I am saved. Thank God I am saved. My name is written down in the book of life. And pray for me as I pray for you that I will make it in. And you will hear people saying they are saved. And you should confess that you are saved. You should be telling yourself, let go through your ears, I am saved. We don't hear that in church any longer. And the church is poorer for that. Get up. Thank God I'm saved. Look at this. Come and hear all ye that fear the Lord. And I will declare what the Lord has done for my soul. You know what he's done for your soul? He has saved your soul. Huh? Why not get up and declare what God has done for your soul? Brother, you don't have to be sitting there all the time doing nothing. There's a lot that you can do. Come with a CD and a solo. We play the CD in the background, you'll sing. You don't have to sing like a lark. As long as we can understand the words, we'll give you the opportunity. Even if you can't sing, I'll give you the opportunity because I want you to do something. Huh? Psalm 96 and verse 3. Declare his glory among the heathen. When you get out there in the world and the bus, at the bus stop, at the supermarket, at the hospital, at the clinic, you declare his glory among the heathen. Declare his wonders among the people. We are hearing about everybody. There was a time when you hear about Michael Jackson all the time. I don't know who you hear about these days because I don't listen to these people. There's some people you just hear about all the time, all the time. You hardly hear Christian people talking about Jesus. You hardly hear Christian people talking about Jesus. We've got to, in these end times, declare his glory among the heathen. Can you give me this translation? Give me one or two more translations. Declare his wonders among all people. Brethren, start talking. Start talking. If you want to declare it, declare it on Facebook. My problem with Facebook is when you're not saying the right things. You're not behaving like a be believer or you're not proving things before, before you say amen and things straight. I ain't got a problem with Facebook other than that. If you're a child of God, you must be decent on Facebook. Use your Facebook to declare the wonders of the Lord. Talk about what the Lord has done for you. If you can't talk about what the Lord has done for you, talk about what he's done for Samson and Delilah. Talk about what he's done for Paul. Talk about how he met Paul on the Damascus Road. But declare, publish his glorious deeds among the nations. There is a move ahead to cancel Christianity. There's a move ahead to cancel the Bible. You probably don't even know what I mean, but there's something now that's called the cancel culture. Huh? So if you're a doctor and you decide that you are not going to commit abortion, you're canceled. You know what I mean? You lose your job. That's what it is. One footballer has been paid over five million pounds a year, not to mention the name Jesus. Did you see it on Facebook this week? Over five million pounds, multiply that by three. That's 15 million dollars, Beijing dollars a year. He's been paid not to mention the name of Jesus. Because you know, after they score a goal, sometimes they go, in another, 15 million, what would you do? That's a lot of money. What would you do? What would you do? There's, enough, there's a move afoot, especially by the Muslims, to cancel Christianity. But we've got to publish or declare his glorious deeds among the people. Let me give you two more scriptures also and see what the Lord is saying. Job, uh, let me forget Job and go to Psalm. Psalm 2 and verse 7. Listen, brother, I'm not just preaching because I don't have anything else to do. I'm here to teach you what the Lord said that you've got to start doing now. We've got to hear more about Jesus. All over the world, we got to hear more about Jesus. I will declare the decree the Lord has said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. So Jesus is speaking and said, I will declare that decree that the Lord has made. Psalm 911, sing praises to the Lord which dwells in Zion. Declare among the people his doings. Has the Lord done anything for you and your family? 
Has the Lord kept you and fed you and prospered you? Has the Lord been good to you? It is time according to Psalm 9 and verse 11 for you to declare among the people his doings. Psalm 22, 31. They shall come and shall declare his righteousness. You need to declare the righteousness of God unto the people that shall be born. In Psalm 30 and verse 18, David declares, and this is something you declare to yourself and to God, for I will declare my iniquity, I will be sorry for my sin. Psalm 64 and verse 9, and all men shall fear and shall declare the work of God, for they shall wisely consider of his doing. Sometimes I'm pro I'll probably get back to this. But brethren, churches are cold these days. Churches are empty. People don't see any reason why they should leave the satisfaction they get from the television picture and come to a church that is dead as a doornail. No young people ain't doing that. If they're going to come to dead church, they prefer to sit down home and watch those stupid African pictures. But we've got to declare we've got to declare we've got to make these declarations and we've got to make sure that we see the hand of God move in this church and in your life when we sing let your glory fall we're not just singing it because it is a song you know when I sing let your glory fall I want to see the glory of God in the church in the Old Testament the Shekinah glory was like a cloud you will see the cloud in the church we want to see a move of God we want to see things done in the spirit and not in the flesh. So, two texts. Number one, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable. So keep talking, start talking. And as you talk, declare God's wondrous doings. Declare his works. Declare what he has done for your soul. Declare his righteousness. Declare the work of God. We've got to mention Jesus. Have you mentioned the name Jesus at any time today? Have you? We got to talk more about Jesus. We got to talk about all his wondrous works. We got to let people know that he's alive. These days I'm zooming in on what he did on the cross of Calvary. Some massive transactions took place at Calvary. He was there wounded for my transgressions. He was bruised for my iniquities. The payment for my peace, so I can't be miserable, was upon him. And with his stripes on his back, I am healed. He who knew no sin became sin for me. That I might be made the righteousness of God. I've got to declare it. You've got to declare it as well. The gospel is not only to be declared by the pulpiteers, the pastors, and, and that, but the gospel must be declared by you. God is expecting you to take this message and run with it. Amen. The simplicity of the gospel.